how many in the audience have heard of 23andMe? Yeah, we got a way of getting in the news. How many people have done 23andMe? Oh, good, good. Um, so in the next 12 minutes or so, um, I'm going to give some examples of the challenges and rewards of using the power of engagement to build a big data set uh, to better understand disease pathophysiology and identify drug targets. Um, the company was founded, you know, we went on the market in like 2007, and the co one of the co-founders, Ann Wojcicki, used to work on um, Wall Street in the healthcare sector, and she was really struck by the fact that the whole kind of incentive for everybody in that space was to get as many sick people as you could get, because then you could sell devices and drugs and services to the sick people, and that there was no big incentives to keep people healthy, and that people, if you asked them, probably would not want that system, and that the consumers really didn't have a voice in any of the healthcare system, and not even that much in their own healthcare. So the, um, the beginnings of 23andMe was really kind of built off of that, and the company's kind of evolved in the way that it's engaged consumers over the years, and we continue to evolve. Um, we were one of the first companies out there trying to do something like this and learning along the way. But it really did come down to, um, you know, getting consumers access to their own DNA, to the, look at their own DNA if they want to, as well as to kind of come up with a new research paradigm that engaged consumers in the process of research as well. So the mission of the company is to help people access, understand, and benefit from the human genome. And we really kind of have, you know, kind of two arms of the company. One is that consumer-facing side, and the other is the um, engaged research side. So on the consumer side, the kinds of information that you can learn from your DNA, um, we've heard about some of the other, other speakers, and 23andMe actually lets you take a look at you. In fact, when you log in and you get your results, it says, welcome to you. And so you learn about your ancestry. You can, learn, you can opt into Relative Finder. You, and we're actually in, um, when we re-release Health later this year, um, we're actually doing an entire site redesign and the experience on the entire site to really kind of make these tools more robust. And ancestry is not unrelated to health either. In medicine, we, we typically will genomic or, uh, uh, ethnically profile our patients when they come into the, into the office. We like, you look Caucasian or you look African. And our, our, the way that we um, decide what you may be more or less at risk for, or even you know, guide you in how to take care of heart disease or manage heart disease, will be based on what we think your ethnicity is. As it turns out, we're really kind of bad at our, our racial profiling that we do. Um, and so even just the ancestry bit of this can empower consumers to take better information to their healthcare providers. Um, you also get information about disease risk, inherited conditions, medication response. Um, the interesting traits is one that the medical community um, made fun of 23andMe and other companies for doing. But from a consumer point of view, this is a really great starting point and a really engaging starting point to get people to think about how genetics works. Because you can see these things, right? The doctors would be like, you know, why would you pay $90, $99 to find out whether or not you have wet or dry earwax? Just stick your finger in your ear. Um, but the truth is, is that when you get that result back, the first thing you do is start talking to other people about their earwax and their genetics, and other people in their family about their earwax, in your family about the earwax and their genetics. And in fact, the number one thing that people do after taking 23andMe is have a um, family health conversation with their family members. Um, so it starts to drive the conversation, it gives you things to start to understand how genetics works, and then you can step over into the other health-related um, information. So we know that consumers want this information. Um, and then, obviously, we've had some challenges. There's uh, been a period of adjustment. So the you know, first DTC companies came out in 2007. 2008, we start to see this um, tension between uh, the government and the incumbent um, medical establishment, where uh, professional societies put out policy statements saying that uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing was dangerous and harmful and could be bad, shouldn't be done, um, as well as we got some letters um, that went out to the states based on recommendations to the government. The same time, 23andMe got Time's Invention of the Year. So you start to see this kind of consumer demand and the tension with the incumbents. Um, 2010, uh, things got serious. That's where the FDA sent out letters to industry, went out to five companies. Most of those companies either switched to not being direct-to-consumer anymore, um, or they went out of business. 
23andMe said, let's figure out how to work with the FDA um, to, to do this the right way. Um, there was a few years that went by of trying to figure that out. In 2013, the FDA uh, actually sent an official warning letter to 23andMe saying to stop marketing their health reports. And so 23andMe took um, those reports out of their US product. And now, uh, for the last several years, you could just get Ancestry and the raw data um, through 23andMe. But we still continue to um, get you know, hundreds of thousands of new consumers to sign up, even with just those, those two offerings. 2015, we start to see you know, a, the, the tide kind of shifting a bit. So we actually did uh, get our authorization to market Bloom Syndrome carrier status, and other reports that are similar to Bloom Syndrome got downclassified with that authorization. So we actually have built a successful relationship with the FDA um, and have a path forward to bring health reports back direct to consumer. We also saw the first professional society revise their policy statement after reviewing 10 years of data showing that there actually is no harm to the individual or um, healthcare system if you let people look at their own DNA. And once the mountain of data got big enough, um, the professional societies really had no choice but to stop and acknowledge the, the data. So, um, you know, really impressed that AMP took a leadership position to be the first ones to go, and I know that several other professional societies are in the process of doing the same. So, other side of the house, participatory research. So, um, at, up, as of today, we've got nine, 950,000 genotype customers. 80% of our customers consent to research, and we have over 300 mil million phenotypic data points on our consumers. We get 2 million new phenotypic data points per day, and we don't even, or sorry, per week, and we don't even have a, a health product on the market right now, and the consumers are still engaged and willing to participate in research. And one of the things that's unique about what 23andMe has built is that this, this database is recontactable. So we can reach back out and ask more refined questions once we find something interesting in e either from a FIWAS or from a GWAS or interesting variants. We can go back and specifically target people and ask them more questions, and they're happy to answer, they're happy to help. Um, and we can do what you can do when you actually build um, the world's largest recontactable genotype phenotype database is a number of things, and I actually have um, an entire 50-minute talk that shows you some really amazing things that you can do. But we don't have time for them, so I'm just going to give you a sampling. But you can um, do real-time analysis. So you can test hypothesis in real time. Um, projects that used to take $5 million, cost $5 million and take five years, can be done in an hour. It really fundamentally changes the way you can seed hypotheses. You can do better variant classification. This is near and dear to my heart. I'm a board-certified molecular pathologist. I've bloodied my forehead for many years against the wall, trying to beat my head against the wall, trying to figure out what these variants mean and these variants of uncertain significance. And I'll show you an example um, of how you can um, better classify variants when you have this. You can identify new drug targets. Um, in 2014, 23andMe had over a dozen large uh, partnerships, collaborations with large pharmaceutical companies, um, as well as um, product companies, you know, things like J&J you know, &J or, um, or Procter & Gamble, to make better products based on, um, on genetics, uh, as well as uh, nonprofit organizations that we work closely with. We can recruit for clinical trials. Um, and you can also understand patient segmentation based on genotype and phenotype. Oh, what's happening there? Oh, there we go. So uh, this is just an example of um, kind of backing up my statement that what used to take $5 million in five years now just takes a couple hours. And I kind of just stole my own thunder on the, the cadence of what's about to happen. So this is just one example, um, proof of concept. There was uh, these large studies, two large studies that came out recently, and if you can see in the methods how many, it's tens of thousands of people, right? These are multi-institutional, you know, millions and millions of dollars. I say five million, but it's probably more than that. Um, probably took longer than five years, but they found this association between cutaneous nevi and breast cancer. And around the same time, there was another group who also spent five million dollars, five million dollars in five years to find exactly the same association. So we just looked at our database and said, how, you know, can we find the same association, and how long would it take us? It took a, a few hours, and we had 45,000 people willing to participate in this survey. Another example, bus resolution. So in this case, there was a family that had um, multi-generational 
pancreatic cancer. It looked for all get out like it should be a hereditary cancer syndrome. They went for the normal testing that, that they were supposed to do, and they didn't find anything. Um, the family had you know, some financial means, so they um, took one of the affected people and did whole genome sequencing on them. This was actually a few years ago when that was still expensive. Um, they, and they didn't really find anything, but there was a variant of uncertain significance in MLH1, which is a gene associated with Lynch syndrome, which can have pancreatic cancer as part of its phenotype. So the family was like, okay, what do you mean variant of uncertain significance? You're all a bunch of geniuses in the ivory tower of academia. How can you not know what this means? And they took it and they, they went around to people in you know, Cambridge and Hopkins and Harvard and Stanford asking everybody, what does this mean? And none of us could say anything other than there's just not enough data in the universe right now to say one way or the other whether this is causing the disease in this family. So then they took it to 23andMe, and they went and looked in their database to see how many people had this variant. And this was a few years ago, so I think we had like a half a million people in the database. And they found that there was 157 people who have this variant. So then the next question is, how many of them have a personal or family history of colon or pancreatic cancer? So we put out a survey, and we pushed it out, and in 12 hours, we got 11,000 people to respond, including most of them that had the variant, and none of the people who had the variant had a personal or family history of pancreatic or colorectal cancer. So this gives us, really, some of the first data in the universe that's kind of pushing this to be more confidently not causing the disease in this family. Here's just a quote. Um, based on a Parkinson's disease uh, publication that the 23andMe scientists put out a few years ago. What 23andMe did in a matter of years would have taken several decades and tens of millions of dollars if done conventionally. We already saw this from one of the previous, previous speakers. Oh. I don't know how to go back. There. Is it back? OK. We already saw this from one of the previous speakers. There it is. <laughs> but about three months ago, um, President Obama uh, decided that he would advocate for building like a big million-person genotype, phenotype database to better understand disease and identify drug targets, which was very validating to us because we thought that was a good idea all along. Um, we hope that uh, the, the federal government engages the consumer and lets the consumer be a part of this and not have it be a one-way street where they're just giving, but also where you're giving information back and preventative health information back and engaging these consumers in their own health. I mean, you can kind of think of 23andMe a little bit like a Myers-Briggs, where it just, it's fun and engaging to think about yourself, you talk about it, you receive the information better, and you're just kind of, you have a more of a health awareness opportunity. So with that... Oh, my, my slides are already done, so. <laughs> Thanks. Oh.